It is in Psalm 38. We finished Psalm 37 last week. We're in Psalm 38. Psalm 38. You, I think you'll find this to be uh, very interesting. And you might even want to listen to it again on the YouTube. I don't know, but it's a good lesson. Uh, let me say it, tell you like this. I wrote this yesterday. I wrote this lesson yesterday. After I finished writing the lesson last night, I read the chapter again. And really, the Lord gave me some more thoughts. So I added some to it. It's, it's not more than about an hour and a half long. <laughs> just playing, just playing. If you're watching my YouTube, I'm just playing. <laughs> this is a psalm of, it's called a penitential psalm, where David is praying a prayer Asking God's forgiveness. Anybody ever pray a prayer like that? Ever ask a prayer, pray a prayer, God forgive me, God I'm sorry. And that's kind of what this prayer is. I mean, this is what this psalm is, kind of that kind of a, uh, a psalm prayer. Listen to what he speaks, how he says it. Psalm 38. O Lord, rebuke me not, in thy wrath, neither chasten me in thy hot displeasure. He's asking God, Lord, I'm asking you, Lord, don't chasten me, don't correct me while you're mad at me. Because he feels like God's mad at him. I mean, it's, that's the way David feels. God's got to be mad at him because David's thinking, I've sinned such great sins. And surely, God would be mad at me. It's what he thinks. So, O Lord, rebuke me not in thy wrath, neither chasten me in thy hot displeasure. For thine arrows stick fast in me, and thy hand presseth me sore. There is no soundness in my flesh because of thine anger. Neither is there any rest in my bones because of my sin. Don't you find that interesting? He's not saying, I haven't sinned. He's admitting his sin. He's talking to the Lord, and he's telling the Lord, I, I, I have sinned. I'm not blaming anybody. It's just that I've done wrong, and I'm talking to the Lord about it. And he comes to a place where he's asking God to forgive him of his sin. Look what he says in verse 4. For mine iniquities are gone over my head. As a heavy burden, they are too heavy for me. My wounds stink and are corrupt because of my foolishness. I am troubled. I am bowed down greatly. I go mourning all the day long. For my loins are filled with a loathsome disease and there is no soundness in my flesh. I am feeble and sore broken. I have roared by reason of the quietness of my heart. Lord, all my desire is before thee, and my groaning is not hid from thee. My heart panteth, my strength faileth me. As for the light of mine eyes, it also is gone from me. And what, he, what he's saying when he says those things, he's saying that my heart is broken. The joy that I once had and the joy that I once in, in, had in my life, it's gone. The light uh, and the laughter and the joy that has been in my heart and in my life, it's gone. And uh, I've sinned in such a way that my heart is heavy and I can't hardly bear it anymore. And so he's gone to the Lord with a repentant heart. They also that seek after my life, excuse me, verse 11, my lovers and my friends stand aloof from my sore, and my kinsmen stand afar off. 
They also that seek after my life lay snares for me, and they that seek my hurt speak mischievous things, and imagine deceits all the day long. But I, as a deaf man, heard not. And I was as a dumb man that openeth not his mouth. Thus I was as a man that heareth not, and, and whose mouth are no reproofs. For in thee, O Lord, do I hope. Thou wilt hear, O Lord my God. For I said, Hear me, lest otherwise they should rejoice over me. When my foot slippeth, they magnify themselves against me. For I am ready to halt, and my sorrow is continually before me. For I will declare mine iniquity. I will be sorry for my sin. But mine enemies are lively. And they are strong. And they that hate me wrongfully are multiplied. They also that render evil for good are mine adversaries. Because I follow the thing that is good. Forsake me not, O Lord. O my God. Be not far from me. Make haste to help me, O Lord, my salvation. David writes this psalm in the midst of his own personal spiritual struggle. This at the writing of this psalm, he is at a low point in his life. There's no telling. It doesn't say what sin that he is confessing. Perhaps I, I looked at it as perhaps it's a time when he's looking back over his life. And he remembers uh, a lot of the things. Perhaps he remembers uh, the Bathsheba thing or remembers uh, Uriah, how he had Uriah killed. Or maybe uh, when his daughter, his own daughter, was raped by one of his own sons. There's a number of things. Or, or the rebellion of his son Absalom. Maybe he's looking at the whole of it all. And he's thinking about this. And uh, he's calling on the Lord to, to help him. He's, he's in the midst of a struggle. Now... I don't know about you, but in my lifetime, I've had some struggles that were pretty heavy at times that I needed to talk to the Lord. And I think that's where David is here. Any one of you could have already suffered. Any one of you could have already suffered through a spiritual struggle. I would say that probably 100% of the time Christians go through a spiritual struggle somewhere along the path of their life. It is possible that one of you may be in a spiritual struggle even tonight. And certainly those who are listening by the way of YouTube could be going through a very difficult period of time in their own life. In my 50, not 5, not 10, not 20, in my 50, Robert, that's older than you are, in my 50 plus years of ministry, I've seen preachers, preachers' wives, deacons and their wives, just good men who have fallen from grace. Not the grace of salvation, but the grace of a joyful and fulfilling life. There's an old saying that I've used recently, but I, it needs to be repeated here. Sin takes you farther than you intended to go. Sin will keep you longer than you intended to stay. And sin will cost you more than you intended to pay. Sin 
is always the root cause of the loss of our joy. While God has forgiven us of all our sin, that ought to be a good amen there. Murder, stealing, immorality, drunkenness, dishonesty, witchcraft, still has consequences in this present evil world. Yes. These are just testimonies here. But I personally have known a couple of guys who used to preach, who got entangled with the affairs of this life. They lost their families. They lost their churches. And they lost the joy of the Lord. And by the way, the joy of the Lord is our strength what keeps us going now this is a very important statement next I mean all of it's important but this is very important to us as far as understanding that we are not above anything like Brandon was saying in the music he's not perfect listen to this some Christians now you did you hear the things that I mentioned those five different things that I mentioned, those are horrible things. But some Christians think they could never commit such terrible sins. But my dear friends, to think that that is simply not possible for you usually means you're not very far away from it. So be careful about Somebody uh, I heard right before church, oh, it's Dorothy, never, never, never going to chase anybody. She said, no. <laughs> but be careful. <clears throat> be careful about being ready to judge Christians who have stumbled and fallen. Be very careful. Uh, in fact, we're taught not even to do that. We are to give a hand up to a brother or sister who has stumbled, even in those Horrible things that we mentioned. My Bible, the Bible that we study each and every week when we come together, clearly teaches this truth. For by grace are you saved. Amen. David is struggling because of his own personal sin. And he pleads with God, please, God, don't be mad at me. Don't chasten me in your hot displeasure of me, of what I've done. He's coming to the Lord. He's repenting. He's telling the Lord. He's being honest with the Lord. So he says, God, please don't be mad at me. And here's another thing that I notice about David. David says, I know I deserve punishment. But please, God, don't be mad at me. While God forgives us immediately when we ask, sometimes it takes a while for us to forgive ourselves. Amen. Right? Am I right about that? God forgives us immediately. But sometimes it takes a while for us to get over it. It's hard sometimes to believe that God is such a loving, forgiving God, isn't it? But remember, God's mercies and God's compa uh, compassions never fail. Isn't that beautiful? David is expressing a true sense of repentance for his own sin. He is not blaming anyone. In verse 18, he says, For I declare mine iniquity. I'm saying that I have sinned. I'm saying that I've done wrong, Lord. 
And he is also expressing a sorrow for what he has done wrong. When we offend someone, when we offend someone, I mean, some of you are so nice and so sweet, I don't think it's possible for you to offend anyone. But along the path of our life, maybe we said some errant word or done some uh, deed that we shouldn't have done or you know some maybe we have offended someone along the way we do not simply expect them to forgive us well I've done wrong I've, I, you know I've offended you oh well they'll forgive me not a flippant attitude if um, they have wherewithal to help us and we are in need of help and we have offended them, we probably don't expect them to reach into their own pocket and help us. We have offended them. David has offended God. He is truly sorry he prays for God to forgive him of his offense. In verse 1, David is asking for God not to be mad at him. I don't know. Maybe we ourselves have thought that a time or two when we've done something we shouldn't have done. God, don't be mad at me. God, I'm sorry. I think we should realize real quick we ought to go to the Lord. Not let it build up and not build up some sort of uh, thoughts in our minds as how... God might uh, be angry at us. But when we sin and we realize we've sinned as quickly as we can, we should go to the Lord and just tell the Lord we're sorry. I, I know our sins are forgiven. I know your sins are forgiven. But my friend, there are consequences to doing wrong. There are consequences in this present evil world. If I have offended anyone. I'm probably not going to go to them when I am in need of help. But I might go to them and ask for their forgiveness. If I'm guilty of the offense, and David sees himself as guilty before God, he has offended God, he's done something that offended his God. And if we have offended a brother, we ought to go to them and, and ask for forgiveness. The Lord tells us, tell me if this is true. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins. Is that right? Is that right? If I have offended my brother, then I need to go to them. Or sister, I need to go to them and tell them I'm sorry. I wish I hadn't said it. I wish I hadn't done it, but I did, and I, and I apologize. David says, Lord, I know you have a right to be angry with me. But please, please don't punish me. I can't bear up to it. Don't punish me while you are angry with me. That's what that verse says. Even the Apostle Paul. How many of y'all are parents in here? About everybody? You got some responsibilities there that way? Even the Apostle Paul tells us as parents not to punish our children in anger. I wish I had been a little smarter when my children were small. Because sometimes I got angry. Shouldn't have done it. But I did. But the Bible tells us not to punish our children in our anger. Ephesians 6.4, if you want to look that up. Ephesians 6.4, if 
you want to look that up. That's what, where Paul tells us. David says in his repentant prayer, David says in his repentant prayer, because of my sin, I have suffered a broken heart. I have suffered sickness even. He says, Lord, my sins are too much for me to bear. Remember, he's praying a repentant prayer. That's what he's praying. My sins have overtaken me. That's a sad state, isn't it? That's a sad state. When sin overtakes a good man or a good woman. And David says his sin has overtaken him. But he cries out, Lord, forgive me. Forgive me. Now listen to this. In the New Testament, in the New Testament, we do not experience the wrath or judgment of God. We do not experience the wrath or judgment of God. But we can experience what is called chastisement. The chastisement of God. Here's a scripture. Hebrews 4 and verse 6 says very plainly, For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every child whom he receives. And then he says, If you endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with a son or a daughter. He loves you. Chastening hand of God is a, a, a form of God's love. Not his anger. In verse 11 of Hebrews 4, it says, No chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous. I don't know about you, but when my dad used to get a switch, I didn't sit there and smile and laugh. I used to do this. I danced when my switch was hitting my legs. Woo! No chastening seemed to be joyous to me. Nevertheless, same verse. Nevertheless, it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness. The chastening hand of the Lord helps us to get our lives back together, straightened out, and going in the right direction. The chaste, chastening hand of the Lord is there to draw us near, not to push us away. Is there a father who will correct the son who, excuse me, is there a father who will not correct the son whom he loves? I don't think so. I think that we will correct the son that we love. I think we will correct our children, son or daughter, because we love them. Do you not know that if the correction is not there, if the child continues to go in a certain direction, that they are headed down a, a, a path of destruction? Do you not know that? Of course you do. And if you can't change that course, that's going to be the end. Now, I know and I believe in the, the grace of God and, and the power of prayer. And I suggest to you as a parent, loving parent, don't ever stop praying for your kids. But you know, you're smart. You know that if a child continues to go in a certain direction, that they're headed down the wrong path, a path of destruction, a path that will ruin their life. You know that. And because you love that child, you correct that child. There has never been a son outside of the Son of God who did not need correction. There's never been a child outside of Jesus, the Son of God, who did not need correction. Solomon said to us, 
train up a child in the way they should go, and when they're old, they will not depart from it. And I will say to you, training is not easy, but it is necessary. Our earthly fathers, Brother Doug, you know, I'm going to use you as an example. You're a pretty good dad. But our earthly fathers have not always been right. And you're a good dad. You're a good father. But our earthly fathers have not always been right. Sometimes they've been wrong. But your heavenly father has always done the right thing. God always wants the best for you. This is an admonition. Unconfessed sin will separate good friends. It will destroy families, churches, and maybe even our health. While God has forgiven us of all our sins, we do not purposefully and knowingly sin against God. We just don't live that way. Yeah, God has forgiven us of all of our sin. Yes, we're free. But we do not knowingly uh, and purposefully sin against God. We do not want to offend our Father. Romans 6.1, another scripture, if, you want, if you're writing it down. Paul asks this question. Shall we continue in sin that God's grace may abound? In other words, should I just keep right on sinning now that I'm saved? Well, I'm going to heaven. I can do what I want. But there are consequences in this present evil world for bad choices, even for the Christian, as far as this world is concerned. In verse 2 of Romans 6, he just simply says, God forbid. No, we should not. Verse 4 says, we should walk in the newness of life. Isn't that beautiful? We should strive, Robert, to do better day by day by day, year after year, year after year. We stumble, we fall, we mess up, we get back on our feet, and God helps us, and we start all over again. And that's really the Christian life. And don't ever think you're above falling. Don't ever think that. The old person inside of you, the old man, as it references in the Bible, the old man has been crucified. We are set free from the power of sin. That does not mean we will never sin. It's just that sin does not have to have control of us the way it used to. It used to control our lives. But now that we're a Christian, trying to follow the Lord, we may sin, but it doesn't have to control our lives. That's, that's the idea. Did you know, I found this to be interesting as I wrote this, that sin, even in the New Testament, can still make you sick? Do you know that sin, even in the New Testament for the Christian, can even cause death? Just ask Ananias and Sapphira. Just ask them. They died as a result of their lying to the disciples. Or ask the church members at the church of Corinth, who partook of the Lord's Supper wrongfully. Paul said some of them were sick, some of them became weak, and some of them went to sleep, never to wake again. That's what he said. My friends, God loves you with an everlasting love. That, is, to me, is so wonderful to know that. 
But make no mistake, God does not wink at sin. He sent his only begotten son to die for our sin. A tragic, terrible death, a crucifixion of one of the worst ways in which someone can die. Jesus came and shed his blood to be able to wash away our sin. So God does not wink at sin. And while we do not have to pay even for one sin, the sinful life has consequences in this present evil world. David wants a right relationship to God, his father. David wants a right relationship to God, his father. So he is confessing his sin. He's asking God for help and forgiveness. And this is so beautiful. God stands ready, willing and able to help you. Just at a moment's notice, God is not mad at you. Oh, man. He is not pointing a finger of condemnation or judgment, but just the opposite. He is trying to warn us of the consequences of sin. He says to you and to me, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. My dear friends, I know that you are my brothers and sisters in Christ. But if along the way I offend you, Please forgive me. Please forgive me. God is our Father. God is our friend. If we ever say a word or do a deed that offends Him, I want Him to know that I'm truly sorry for offending my, my Heavenly Father. You know, I love him more than anyone or anything else in this, in this life. He's first, and he must be first. You put him first, and all other relationships take their rightful place. David finishes this penitential psalm by saying, Lord, please don't ever leave me. Please don't ever go away from me. If you got somebody you love, you never want them to leave you. You never want them to go away from you. How sad the heart that never knows God's love and God's forgiveness. I'm going to stop right there. I hope it was a blessing to you. It was a good psalm, wasn't it? God bless each and every